Hello, it's 10 a.m. on Friday, the 3rd of April. You're tuned in to our mid morning newscast here on Alidang TV. I'm Mark Broom. Let's take a look at the headlines. The key parameters to a deal on Iran's nuclear program are agreed, including restrictions on uranium enrichment in exchange for international sanctions being lifted. President Park Geun-hye and visiting U.S. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi see eye to eye on pressing Japan to resolve the issue of its wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. Plus, gunmen storm a university college compound in Kenya near the border with Somalia, killing 147 people in an attack claimed by the radical Islamist group Al-Shabaab. Our top story this morning, the bitter and more than decade-long standoff between the West and Iran over Tehran's nuclear program could soon be reaching an end. This after Iran and the six world powers agreed to a framework for a deal to curb Iran's nuclear development. This in return for the lifting of international sanctions. The parties will attempt to iron out the details and reach a final agreement by the end of June. Our Choi Sun starts us off. After eight days of marathon negotiations in Switzerland, Iran and the so-called P5 plus one nations agreed to a framework for a deal to curb Tehran's nuclear development program. It's not a final deal, but a significant step towards extending the time it would take Iran to build a nuclear weapon by at least 10 years. Iran will be able to continue its peaceful nuclear program, but there will be limitations placed on the level and the duration of its enrichment program and the quantity of enriched material that can be kept. Under the framework, Tehran has agreed to suspend two-thirds of its centrifuges that can be used to produce weapons-grade uranium. It will also dismantle a plutonium-producing reactor and allow international inspectors to monitor all of its nuclear facilities on a regular basis. The U.S. and the European Union's economic and financial sanctions concerning Tehran's nuclear activities will be lifted in phases, but will be reinforced if Tehran breaks its commitments. Iran and the five U.N. Security Council permanent members plus Germany are now tasked with reaching a final agreement by June 30th, after which international sanctions relief will start. And I am convinced that if this framework leads to a final comprehensive deal, it will make our country, our allies, and our world safer. While the West and the UN chief welcomed the news, Israel, a strong opponent of Iran's nuclear program, said any deal must significantly roll back Iran's nuclear capabilities. The leaders of the U.S. and Iran face another hurdle at home as the final agreement is viewed with skepticism by many lawmakers in Washington and Tehran. Choi yoo Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye is calling for U.S. Congress support to address the issue of Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. Meeting in Seoul on Thursday, U.S. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi agreed with President Park, saying Japan needs to address its past wartime sexual slavery as a human rights issue. Our Jim Young gil has more. Nancy Pelosi called for Prime Minister Shinzo Abe to apologize for the Japanese military's coercion of young Korean and other Asian women into sexual slavery during World War II. Uh, we have been clear about uh, what we'd like to hear about uh, comfort women. Whether the president, Prime Minister does that in that speech or not, uh, I hope that a statement will be made. It's an issue that Seoul has repeatedly pressed on Tokyo. During talks earlier with President Park Geun-hye, Pelosi expressed sympathy over the matter, saying it's a women's rights issue that should be solved. President Park pushed its urgency as the last surviving Korean victims are in their late 80s. Korea hopes to help U.S. lawmakers better understand the issue of Japan's wartime wrongdoings ahead of Abe's address to a joint session of the U.S. Congress. Diplomatic relations between Korea and Japan have been very tense, with the Abe administration reluctant to clearly acknowledge Japan's past.
Seoul had criticized Abe for attempting to shift the blame for the forcible recruitment of the so-called comfort women to private brokers, denying the Japanese government's involvement. Pelosi and the other nine members of Congress will head to Japan on Friday. Kim young Arirang News. And Nancy Pelosi also met with Korean Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se, where Minister Yoon is reported to have said the Japanese Prime Minister should specifically refer to Tokyo's past acknowledgement of its wartime sexual enslavement in his U.S. congressional speech. Seoul's Foreign Ministry said Yoon asked for Washington's support on the matter so that Abe's speech can send a positive message to Korea and other countries that were so terribly affected by Japan's imperialistic atrocities. It's the first time the Korean minister called for expressions such as Japan's past aggressions, colonial rule and comfort women issue in regards to Abe's upcoming speech. Pelosi, however, is reported to have maintained a position that the inclusions are the Japanese leader's decision. Tensions continue to simmer over North Korea's unilateral decision for a pay rise for its workers at the joint Kaesong Industrial Complex. The South Korean government is calling for a wage freeze until an inter-Korean agreement is reached, warning of legal measures against companies that disregard the order. Our Hwang Sang-hee reports. In a statement on Thursday in Seoul, the Unification Ministry asked for a minimum wage freeze for North Korean workers until a deal is reached between the two Koreas. The ministry warned that companies ignoring the freeze could face administrative and legal measures under the Inter-Korean Exchange and Cooperation Act. The statement comes just over a week before payday for the workers starts on April 10th. Last month, North Korea demanded a unilateral pay raise and revision of 13 regulations, including scrapping the current salary cap of 5 percent. South Korea says these issues must be settled through government-level talks. The wage tussle is raising concerns that another unilateral shutdown of the complex could follow. But experts say Pyongyang will refrain from repeating the closure it initiated two years ago. If the Kaesong Industrial Complex closes again, it will be hard to turn inter-Korean relations around. So it's highly likely that North Korea will use it as a means to intimidate and pressure South Korea. The Kaesong Industrial Complex, where more than 54,000 North Koreans work at 124 South Korean companies, is the last remaining form of inter-Korean cooperation. A high-ranking South Korean official said that the best way to improve the management of the joint business park is to open it up to more foreign companies. Now, both sides agreed to that measure nearly two years ago, but little progress has been made so far. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. North Korea has slammed the Japanese government for police raids on a Pro Pyongyang group in Tokyo, this in connection with an investigation into the country's past abductions of Japanese nationals. North Korea says such moves make the prospect for bilateral talks impossible. Gon Soa reports. Pyongyang isn't happy about the way Japan is investigating North Korea's abduction of Japanese nationals in the 1970s and 80s. The North state-run Korean Central News Agency reported Thursday that Pyongyang sent a letter to Japan denouncing raids on the General Association of Korean Residents in Japan, a pro-North Korean body that functions as the de facto North Korean embassy in Tokyo. Pyongyang called it a severely political provocation and an infringement of Pyongyang's sovereignty, and is not only seeking an explanation, but also an apology. The North Korean regime also accused Japan of, quote, playing up the abduction issue internationally. Last year, Japan and the EU submitted a draft resolution to the UN against North Korea's human rights abuses, including the matter of abductees. Relations between the two countries appear to be souring. This latest complaint comes less than a year after Pyongyang and Tokyo both agreed on investigations into the abduction issue at a meeting in Stockholm. Tokyo had lifted some sanctions in return for the probe, but so far North Korea hasn't delivered any results. Kwon Arirang News.
The top nuclear envoys from the United States and Russia met in Moscow on Thursday for discussions on long, the long-stalled six-party talks on North Korea's denuclearization. Russia's foreign ministry says Sun Kim and Igor Morgolov talked about ways to restart the multilateral dialogue. Russia says it wants to get back to the negotiating table to ease political and military tensions on the Korean peninsula. The ministry, however, gave no further details on what was a closed-door meeting. It marked the first time since he became U.S. Special Representative for North Korea policy that Sung Kim visited Russia or has met with a high-ranking Russian official. Get connected to Korea and the world. Join us every weekday for the latest developments out of Korea, Asia and beyond. On air, on your mobile and online, we lead the way every day at Young News. To try and resolve the crisis in Ukraine, the European Union also offers 50... Now, Korea's foreign exchange reserves rose for the second straight month in March. The Bank of Korea says reserves came in at around 363 billion US dollars as of the end of uh, last month. Uh, that's up 380 million dollars from February. The central bank attributes the increase to a rise in investment profits that offset a drop in the value of euro denominated assets. The euro slumped over 3% against the greenback last month. Korea has the seventh largest foreign exchange reserves in the world, following China, Japan, Switzerland and a few others. Korea's exports are losing steam as the country's traditional growth engine. The contribution of outbound shipments to growth fell to a five-year low last year due to sluggish demand abroad and falling global oil prices, our Hwang Jie reports. Just one and a half percentage points from Korea's 3.3 percent growth last year came from exports of goods and services. That equals a contribution to growth rate of around 45 percent, the lowest reading since 2009, right after the global financial crisis. The Bank of Korea data shows that the contribution rate shot up to over 200 percent in 2011, but has been on a downward trend since then. Now, concern is building over the recovery pace of Asia's export powerhouse Korea, as demand at home also remains fragile. China's slowing growth is a major uncertainty for Korean exports, which rely heavily on the world's second largest economy. It's unlikely that the domestic economy will improve drastically this year compared to 2014. Korea's exports actually dropped for the third straight month in March, with a decline from February to March logging the biggest slump in over two years. The government blames the fall on the drop of international oil costs, which are keeping prices low for petrochemical products, one of the major exporting items. But even if oil-related products are not counted, outbound shipments rose a mere 0.2 percent in March from the previous year, pointing to sluggish demand from consumers worldwide. The government says it will devise short-term measures like strengthening the competitiveness of local small and mid-sized exporters. But experts add that it's more critical to diversify and expand Korea's exporting market to the Middle East and South and Central America. Now it's the best time of year for fans of automobiles because the Seoul Motor Show has kicked off on this Friday. Automakers from around the world are rolling out their new models and also some very interesting looking concept cars in the hope of attracting potential buyers and to give us a glimpse into the future for a peek into this year's event and the cars that are creating the most buzz. Our Kim Minji reports. Flashy and sleek take center stage at this year's Seoul Motor Show with major brands pulling out all the stops. Under the theme Experience the Technology, Feel the Artistry, automakers are showcasing models that fuse cutting edge trends with sophisticated designs. Kia Motors pulled the curtain back on its much anticipated revamped K5. The sedan is equipped with state of the art tech, offering a safe drive and cheek design that can appeal to drivers of all ages. 
Cars are no longer limited to just the driving experience. It's a part of our everyday lives. Our focus was to make the car a part of the driver's lifestyle and culture. Foreign brands are also making a big showing. Many use the occasion to showcase its mini Super Leggera vision concept. It's gained attention for its roadster shape, unique styling and classic interior. And riding on the environmentally friendly trend, a majority of local and foreign brands have also included green cars in their showcase lineup. BMW's i8 plug-in hybrid sports car made its local debut. The German car maker says it's a glimpse into the future and has even taken into consideration Korea's lack of infrastructure for such vehicles. We've installed 120 charging facilities at supermarkets across the nation for customers to use. More than 300 vehicles are on site, but if the showroom isn't enough, there's also a variety of hands-on activities visitors can check out, including driving simulations. The motor show runs through April 12th. Kim min Arirang News. Now, a day of complete horror for those in Kenya when massed gunmen stormed a university campus and took hostages. For more on this and other global stories, we connect to Eunice Kim at the News Centre. So, Eunice, authorities have gotten a handle on this situation. Uh, this was a completely brazen attack and the body count is extremely high and uh, has risen dramatically from the early figures we were hearing. That's right, Mark. According to government officials, it has risen to 147. That's 147 students and staff who were killed by militants who have been identified as belonging to the Somali Islamist group Al-Shabaab. It was a scene of complete chaos. Garissa University College in northeastern Kenya. Authorities say the four gunmen who burst onto the campus in the early morning hours have been all killed. Police and soldiers had surrounded the college uh, throughout the day, exchanging gunfire with the attackers. The militants are said to have come carrying AK-47s and also that they were wearing suicide vests. And according to Kenya's interior minister, he said they exploded like bombs as the confrontation ended. Nearly 600 students were rescued or escaped. 79 of them have been injured. The government has identified a high-ranking Al-Shabaab official named Mohammed Kuno as the mastermind of this attack. Yeah, truly shocking. And uh, let's move on to an update on the German Wings probe that is ongoing. And German state prosecutors gave us an update on the criminal investigation. Yeah, that's right. They said they found web searches on the co-pilot Andreas Lubitz's tablet computer on ways to commit suicide and also searches on cockpit doors. Here's what they said. According to the results, the user informed himself about medical treatments as well as different kinds of and the implementation of a suicide. On at least one day, he had searched for several minutes about cockpit doors and their safety precautions. And he went on to say that they believe the 27-year-old German Wings co-pilot had used the device between March 16th and March 23rd. And you'll remember uh, the passenger plane crash was one day later on March 24th or last Tuesday. Based on this evidence, investigators say they believe Lubitz intentionally crashed flight 9525 when he locked the pilot out of the cockpit and took control of the aircraft. There's also also another significant uh, development over in France, a French prosecutor announced that they had found the second black box recorder, that is the flight data recorder. They said it was blackened and damaged, but they are uh, reasonably hopeful that they would be able to uh, gather, harvest some useful information from that black box, Mark. Well, let's hope so, Eunice. They describe those things as pretty much indescribable, so let's hope they can get some useful information regarding 
uh, this awful plane crash. Hopefully Thank you it so much. answers a lot of questions. Yeah, hopefully it does. Yes, yeah. they have uh, two now in their hands. Well, as always, Eunice, it's a pleasure, and uh, we'll see you back at noon. See you then. And TGI Friday, if you want, as we kick things off with the 2015 ANA Inspiration, the first LPGA major of the season, which teed off his first round of the event. And with so many golfers looking to claim the top prize, there are two players in the spotlight. Now, first off, for Hall of Famer Puck Saidi, who finished tied for fourth last year, it's a chance for her to achieve a career grand slam. As she has won the LPGA Championship three times, U.S. Women's Open once, and the British Open back in 2001. But looking to outplay her is teenage sensation Lydia Ko, who seeks her first LPGA major and can become the youngest major winner at a young age of 17. Now with the IBK Altos and the OK Savings Bank winning this year's V-League championship titles in the women's and men's league respectively, their next big quest? Well, beating the Japanese champions. In an annual matchup which started back in 2006 is back in action after last year's event was cancelled. But for volleyball fans here in the nation, it's a chance to see the two champions in Korea face off against the Japanese V-League champions as the IBK Altos and the OK Savings Bank will take part in the event on March 12th in Seoul at the Changchun Gymnasium. And speaking of champions, the Ursan Mobis Phoebus look to get a 3-0 series lead in the KBL Championship Series on Thursday night as they went up against Wonju Dongwu Promi who desperately looked to rebound from an 0-2 deficit. But Mobis with other plans here, trying to end this series early as they take a comfortable 40-29 to lead going to halftime. But with Tongbu changing up their game plan in the second half, they cut their deficit down to 53-52, to hoping to continue the hot shooting in the fourth quarter. But with point guard Yang yong gun tearing it up from the paint with 23 points without a single foul, Mobis would run away with this game 80-72 to as they're now one win away from their third straight championship title. Now, the Suwon KT Wiz might be struggling in their first season in the KBO League so far, but they've already gone viral all around the world for their unique ceremonial first pitch, and it didn't involve any rhythmic gymnasts. Now, with the Suwon KT Wiz kicking off their first KBO League game last Saturday, check out this ceremonial first pitch, a fireball which started off at the center field screens and made its way for a strike at the home plate. And while it did well everyone here in Korea, it also gone viral overseas as a number of media outlets have been talking about the hot first pitch. Well, that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ for your sports needs. Good morning. Much needed yesterday's rain helped to ease the drought in many parts of the country. And it seems like most of the rain clouds have moved out from the peninsula. And the misty and cloudy morning will turn to partly sunny skies as the sun will try hard to come out from behind the clouds. And we'll also have clean air throughout the day today. So feel free to open the door and let some, or window and let some fresh air in. Take an advantage of it. And the top temperatures will be hovering upper teens to low 20s across the nation. So let's take a closer look. The daytime high here in Seoul will hike up to 17, while Daegu and Gwangju rise to 23 and 19, and Busan will top out at 22 this afternoon. And as for the other regions, Jeju Island and Daejeon should both see a high of 18, while Dokdo gets up to 16. Now we have one more round of spotty rain in the forecast from tomorrow evening at about 6 p.m., and it will rain till early Sunday morning, but the temperatures will continue to be on the mild side. Well, that's all for Korea, and here's international weather for viewers around the world.
Well, those are the stories we've been following this Friday morning from Seoul. Before we go, though, Arirang TV will have a new schedule and lots of brand new programming from next Monday. So there'll be no more newscasts at this time of the day. But we will still have our news bulletins at 6 a.m. and noon Korea time, as well as an all-new business news show sandwiched between those. That will be uh, broadcast at 8 a.m. Korea time. Uh, we hope you can catch us then, but for now, that's it. Have a wonderful weekend. Goodbye.